It's an election year and politicians are talking about taxes. Those on the political left generally say that the rich are not paying their fair share and that taxes should be increased. Those on the political right are generally saying that lower taxes rev up the economy. And of course, most of us complain that taxes are too high. Hi, I'm Richard Nelson, the Executive Director of the Commonwealth Policy Center, and thank you for joining the Commonwealth Matters, where today we're going to talk tax policy with Brian Dimitrovic, the Richard S. Strong Scholar at the Laffer Center, which promotes the core tenets of supply-side economics and educates people on free market ideas. Brian previously served as the chair of the Department of History at Sam Houston State. He's also the co-author of the recent book, Taxes Have Consequences, an Income Tax History of the United States, which is the topic of our conversation today. Brian, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Richard. Hey, uh, I appreciate uh, the book you just came out with, Taxes Have Consequences, had a chance to begin reading it. Uh, it by the way, just full disclosure, <laughs> I am not an economist. I am not a numbers person, but I do pay taxes. <laughs> and, and I think that we pay, uh, pay too much in taxes. And your book uh, helps us to understand what tax policy does, not just on a personal level, but uh, what it does to our economy and to certain segments of the population. It's a very readable book. And uh, I, I do appreciate you joining us to talk further uh, further about this. Brian, tell us what prompted you to write about the income tax history of the United States? Sure. Yeah, I'm a historian. I mean, I've been writing about the history of supply side economics of the great Reagan revolution in economic policy from the 1970s and 80s for a long time, at least 15, uh, 20 years. And it occurred to me and to Arthur Laffer and Jean, Jeannie Sinkfield, who are my co-authors in Taxes Have Consequences, that if um, you investigate the entire history of the income tax, which goes back exactly 111 years, back to 1913, you can really kind of disprove all these kind of common uh, left-wing liberal progressive verities about the income tax, such as that if you raise taxes on the rich, you collect more revenue. Of course not. Um, so we, uh, we embarked on, on writing it, mainly because we saw uh, some left-wingers, Manuel Saez and Thomas Piketty in particular, uh, saying all these kind of unbelievable things about taxation, that uh, the great eras were high tax eras. And we said, no, we know the history. And that's why we wrote the book. Okay, very good. So uh, up until 1913, there was no federal tax, uh, federal progressive income tax, that is. What was the impetus that led our federal government to uh, to propose that? Of course, the Constitution had to be amended in order to allow the federal government to impose an income tax, and that was the 16th Amendment that was proposed, passed by Congress, ratified by the states. Uh, what was the impetus behind that? Yeah, wow, that's a big question in American history. And I, I think it's it's really understudied uh, for all the historians we have. Um, we actually did not embark too much upon that question in the book about why it happened in 1909 to 1913. I have some some of my own views about that that are uh, maybe a little bit uh, uh, speculative or adventuresome, but wh why not? I mean, I'll, I'll treat you to some of them. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the main, the main revenue sources for the federal government in 1912 were the tariff, about 67%, and then alcohol and tobacco, tobacco taxes for about the other third, maybe 10% other taxes. Um, government, government, total government spending was maybe 6% across all levels of government. You know, today it's 35. So certainly one reason that the federal government adopted an income tax was so that it could get big. When you tax the domestic population as opposed to the foreign population, you already have hold of your tax payers. You, can, you don't have hold of foreigners by definition. So when, when, when the tariff was the principal revenue engine. The United States government had to be small because the taxes were completely voluntary. Foreigners had to come here to volunteer to pay the tax. Um, so one reason was the government wanted to get big. And why did it want to get big? Uh, yeah, okay, government wants to get big. Well, immediately, what did the United States government do over the next generation? Immediately, it fought two huge foreign wars. So I think the first reason the United States um, passed the income tax was so, so that it could launch itself into foreign wars. I think that's the first reason. 
And I think the second reason was to put to bed the Civil War. I, I consider the 16th Amendment the last of the Civil War amendments. I mean, it was exactly on the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg and the and there were all sorts of events in 1913 expressing the reconciliation between North and South. I mean, the Gettysburg battlefield handshakes um, across the, the veterans in 1913. And uh, the income tax was structured so that virtually it was almost just the Yankees, just the New York Yankees who would pay, who would pay it, uh, the very richest people who were all in the former Union states. And I think it was a gesture to overcome the tariff, which the South had hated, and to kind of bind up the nation's wounds in Lincoln's sense. And then together, jointly, to go on great a great adventure, and that was the, the World Wars. That's a fascinating explanation. Uh, and of course, you, you, you did see that it uh, brought together the states in a cohesive way when there was a strong federal government. Uh, it, it really made us a national people instead of a state-centered people. Uh, and, uh, and, it, and it did increase the size of government, which I think is, as a people, Brian, we have been skeptical of big government. We've been skeptical of powerful government. This is what led us to separate from Great Britain. And uh, of course, then we, uh, we we allowed the government to not just tax us, to, to give the federal government um, income tax uh, uh, taxing authority, but to grow to a huge state. Uh, you've said that a, th a third, 35 uh, percent of our income, what was that? 35 percent of our income is going to support government at various levels. Is that correct? Yeah, right now at all levels, state level, state, uh, local, federal. I mean, state government basically didn't exist back then, maybe half a percent of GDP. I mean, I actually believe that the income tax in the United States caused World War I. I mean, it gave it gave the rest of the world the surety that the United States would come in to save them if they did something crazy. So they did. And then the United States came in and saved them. Same thing in World War II. So, no, I, I think um, it was a, a kind of a, a malignant development if the United States had, had not passed the income tax in 1913. I actually take seriously the notion that Europe would not have started World War I. Now, of course, when the income tax was uh, uh, enacted, uh, it only affected the highest wage earners. And the rate on these highest wage earners was between 1% to 7%. Um, to me, just looking at that, it seems to me that there was class envy there. We'll just tax the rich, right? It's all, and it's going to be at a small rate. Why not, if you're going to be fair and just with our laws, shouldn't there be a tax on everybody? Of course, that would have passed. That would not have gone through, uh, but yet they looked at the high wage earners and they said it's a low rate. The reason I bring that up is because to me that seems to drive so much of the discussion over tax policy today. Well, the rich aren't paying their fair share. We hear President Biden talk about this frequently. The rich just need to pay their, pay their fair share. There's this class envy, maybe class warfare mentality which uh, is destructive to any nation. And you do talk about um, the, what leads to civil war and to conflicts. And it is this argument over uh, the, the taxes and over wages and over uh, how much the government should get. Um, do you see that as being the core of, let's say, far left political ideology? Just it's this class warfare. We just need to, the, the rich need to pay their fair share. Is that part of their ideology, would you say? Yeah, I, I mean, it's certainly become that and it, it, it quickly became that in the era of the income tax. I'm, I fear that at the time, the rich kind of volunteered for it. I mean, if you read Andrew Mellon's, just the single most remarkable book ever written about, treatise ever written about taxation in American history is Andrew Mellon's 1924 book, uh, Taxation, the People's Business. Andrew Mellon was basically the richest person in the world at that point, you know, maybe Rockefeller. Um, and he was Secretary of the Treasury, and uh, he could certainly watch uh, the income tax come into existence, 1909 to 1913. Um, he, he thought in that book, and in lots of statements, he was a laconic individual, of course, um, that taxation could be removed as a political issue if the rich just picked up the bill. But the key thing was that the, the bill had to be small, had to be less than 10%, less than a religious tithe. Um, because he, you know, he demonstrated that religions had long shown for you know millennia that if, if there's a really well invested civilization, if people really care about the religion, adore it, just let let it guide their 
their life, they will volunteer to pay a 10% tax. So if we really like the United States of America, we think it's the last best hope of earth, all that stuff, you can tax the rich at under 10% and they'll volunteer for it. And that would remove the issue of taxation from the body politic, that contentious issue, which probably gave us the Civil War to talk about the, you know, the, the, the Southern perspective, which was still very active. We know, Today, we don't take seriously. We, we laugh at the idea that the tariff caused the Civil War. Well, that's not the way a lot of people thought about it in 1913. And there was a sense, well, why don't we just have the Yankees just with their rich riches pick up the, you know, set, pay 7% of their income? And the rich people said, okay, let's do that if we can just displace all this sectional conflict. Um, so I, th I think the rich were actually complicit in starting the income tax. Then of course it got completely out of control. The top rate of the income tax was 11 times higher, 77% in 1918, and then all bets were off. Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit, how the progressive income tax progressed. Uh, so you just mentioned that the highest tax rate, 77% since 1913? Yeah, so it, it went to 77% in 1918. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about what does that mean in practical terms? When we talk about a 77% tax rate, that means that uh, people get to keep uh, 23% or 23 cents of every dollar, correct? That's exactly what that means. So since, so the top tax rate has been above 60% from 1932 to 1980. And then from 1987 to 2020, that tax rate dropped a bit. The top tax, top tax rate ranged from 28 to 40 percent. Now, you argue that there is a strong correlation between strong. Uh, there's a correlation between strong economic growth and lower tax rates. Um, and yet we don't hear this. You mentioned it just a few minutes ago that those on the uh, political left or maybe his, historical revisionists say that that's not the case. Tell us about this correlation between strong economic growth and lower tax rates. Sure, yeah, I mean, that really is the meat of the book, I, I have to tell you. So uh, the tax rate was zero, income tax rate was zero uh, prior to 1913, say 1912, and you know, I mean, that era was the greatest period of economic growth that the world has ever seen. So from 1789, when the nation was founded through uh, 1912, uh, the United States redefined what it meant to grow as a mass society. So zero corresponded with incredible growth. All right, so now you have a tax system from you know 1913 to 1929, and 1913 to 1921, you know, was bad. You had a reset, you know, the wartime, which completely diminished private production, which is the stuff of economic growth. You had a nasty recession, probably the you know probably the worst in American history from 1919 to 21, and then as the top tax rate went down from 73 percent 1921 via Andrew Mellon down to 25% over the next four years, you had the roaring 20s. So as tax rates went down, boom. In 1930, the United States decides to raise taxes again, first the tariff, and then January 1st, 32, the income tax rate up by 150%, Great Depression. Um, so the correlation was very clear uh, through the first 30 years of the income tax. After World War II, when income tax rates statutorily are very high, there's no real... Um, determination on the part of the government to collect those revenues. So income tax rates were 80, 90% in the latter 40s, the 1950s and early 60s, in which there's pretty good economic growth in many cases, but there's no enforcement of those rates. I mean, federal tax collections on the income tax side were at most, you know, 8%. Total federal spending maybe reached 16%. Heck, in 1948, it was 11% down by two by, by three quarters from 1944. So, I mean, government was shrinking and the tax, the, there was just so many loopholes that they made the tax rates irrelevant. You say in your book, uh, Brian, that income earners facing a tax, facing high tax rates will spend less, earn less and search for ways to avoid, avoid paying that tax. Is this the basis? Is this mindset? Which, by the way, this is human nature, right? <laughs> if we have somebody that's trying to take away the resources that we've earned, we're going to try to protect it. We're going to try to save it for our own use, for our families, uh, for our own communities. Um, and that's just, it's common sense. It's human nature as well. Um, but is this the basis for supply side economics? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the founder of supply side economics, Arthur Laffer, my co-author, just on the point you just made, Richard, which is an excellent point. He always says, you know, economists have no real ear, no real, they have a, 
a tin ear for understanding taxation because people respond to taxation so naturally, so organically, so personally. I mean, it's like economists studying what kind of music gets you going. I mean, people just respond so naturally to taxation. There's no way a scholarly economist is going to figure it out. I mean, it's just too natural. And if you have high tax rates, people will not will avoid you know, the, the activity that uh, is taxed in, in favor of other activity. And that is that's the story of American economic history under under the income tax regime since 1913. Kentucky is at a crossroads. We can choose to give in to the radical left or we can choose to engage the culture in a God honoring way. I started the Commonwealth Policy Center because I believe that Christians have a responsibility to influence government and society to the glory of God. While the Commonwealth Policy Center has made a significant impact, our work isn't finished. If you'd like to join our movement working for timeless values, then head to our website. To learn more, go to CommonwealthPolicyCenter.org. If you're just joining us, you are tuned into the Commonwealth Matters. I'm Richard Nelson here with Brian Dimitrovic, the co-author of the book, Taxes Have Consequences, and we are talking about tax policy. Brian, the rich are often maligned in this country. Uh, it, it, we see it regularly in the news. But you say in your book, um, you say that the highest earners and the rich are the stewards of the economy. And because of it, we've had incredible growth and development in the modern world. They bring investment capital, managerial experience, and entrepreneurial vision. They bring workforces together. And because of this, um, all of society benefits. And what you're saying is true, <laughs> you can, it's verified, but it's not articulated when people talk about tax policy. It, they just look at, a, they reduce it into a simplistic for, formula of, Somebody has more, they've accumulated this great wealth, and they must be taxed. <laughs> We're questioning, how did they get it? <laughs> Was it fair how they got it? And therefore, they must be taxed. But what you say here, their uh, entrepreneurial vision, uh, they can manage uh, the company, they can hire people, they can bring a workforce together. Um, we miss all of that in our conversations, don't we? Yeah, I mean, we... The, the, a progressive income tax, especially one with high rates, focuses attention on the rich because if you have, if you're going to tax people according to their level of income, more tax rates, higher tax rates, higher the income, then then that's who we have to focus on. Then the tax system is targeting those who are making high income. So we made the top one percent, therefore, the primary focus of our book. You have a progressive tax system with rates going up to the ninety percent in American history. We're going to look how the one percent responded, and we found uh, from 1913 to the present that whenever the rich are targeted with really high taxes, they do a number of things. Number one, they just earn less income. It's like, well, you're going to tax me more. I'm not going to earn as much. That's a perfectly natural response. They don't need the money. They're the top one percent. They already have it packed away. So the first thing they do is they don't earn as much. The second thing that they do is that they decide that, well, if I'm still going to whatever I do earn. I'm going to shelter from taxation legally. And then the third result is because the rich aren't earning as much and because they have changed their behavior to shelter their income, everyone else is worse off because the rich, in fact, are the stewards of the economy. They are the ones who are earning the most money because of entrepreneurial vision or because of managing businesses. So if they decide to scale back, number one, and number two, to change their activities to suboptimal activities, that there are tax shelters, <laughs> the chance that people will be employed or flourish who are not 1% is severely diminished. That's why we had the Great Recession. That's why we had the Great Depression and all the kind of washouts and unemployment that we've had since 1913, because the tax system attacked the rich. Uh, and yet we hear the term supply side, which... Uh, mm -hmm. Your colleague, uh, Arthur Laffer, um, coined, he was, of course, an advisor uh, to Ronald Reagan. Um, that's, that term is often derided. We hear trickle down, trickle down economics. That's a derisive term. And yet there's, uh, there's history that's behind this idea of less taxation, allowing people to keep their own resources, to develop uh, businesses, to invest it back into their communities and into the economy. And yet it's still a derisive, uh, such a derisive term today. Um, Brian, you uh, 
you say that the fascinating part in your book uh, is that tax revenues as a share of gross domestic product are often static, maybe just around 20% of the GDP. And it does not matter what the tax rates are. I can't remember if this is you or Art Laffer that said it, but regardless of what the tax rates are, tax revenues as a share of GDP are static, whether the taxes are really high or really low. Um, so, so if it doesn't matter what the tax rates are, um, how do you argue that we should have lower tax rates? Sure. Yeah. These are kind of the venerable economic principles. Hauser's law after an economist named Hauser is that the uh, total tax revenue for the federal government is always around 20%, no matter what the no matter what the, uh, the tax system is. And in Reynolds Law, after Alan Reynolds, the guy who actually did uh, play a role in coining the term supply side economics with Jude Winiski and Arthur Laffer, uh, he has Reynolds Law, uh, which is the total income tax revenue, not from, so just, just that source is always about the same, always about 9%, no matter what the tax rates are, 28% in 1988 or you know 91% in uh, 1955. Um, so why not just have low tax rates? <laughs> Alan Reynolds says, well, I know why the government doesn't want uh, low tax rates. Uh, we learned this the hard way in 1986 when the top tax rate, which had been 70% in 1980, all of a sudden 1988, care of the 1986 Tax Reform Act uh, is down to 28%. And uh, lobbyists stopped showing up uh, to the government. Andrew Mellon predicted this back in the 20s. Um, when you have a high tax rate, there's a very high priority on getting an exemption from that tax rate, getting getting a shelter written into the code. And boy, does that aggrandize Congress, because all of a sudden, when there's a high tax rate up 50, 60, 70 percent, Congress gets invitations to dinner and all sorts of stuff from all the rich people. Congress becomes very important to the top people, the top earners in this country, and it just just builds up this self-importance of Congress. So when you lower top tax rates down to you know 28%, 15%, whatever, Andrew Mellon's tithe of 10%, 7%, nobody shows up to Congress. It's just like, whatever, I'll just pay the 7%. And it completely diminishes Congress's sense of uh, self-importance. Um, so uh, that we have high tax rates is simply a testament to Congress lacks virtue. If Congress had virtue, it would be content to be insignificant. But since it lacks virtue, it has high tax rates and we get lower revenue. So it's a virtue problem. Of course, the uh, uh, approval rating of Congress has been at all time low for uh, several years. Uh, it's dipped down into the single digits. People are not pleased with Congress uh, for a number of reasons. Um, uh, Brian, I want to move to uh, something that Arthur Laffer said about the, the cost when there are high taxes. He said the real portion of the payment, and I think he's talking about taxes, is a destruction of output where everyone suffers enormously. This is called transfer theorem. Um, who suffers from this idea when there's high taxes and when the wealthy are not investing in their businesses and hiring people and creating products? Who suffers when you have high taxes and then this transfer theorem, this transfer payments, if you will? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's no question that disproportionately the least well off the bottom 50% uh, suffers the most with high taxes on the rich because I mean, another one of our uh, co-author, Jeannie Sinkfield, I mean, she was a, a, a great uh, sage on this score because she was a, you know, founding, a big business founder. I mean, she knows uh, what, what Jeannie always emphasized is like, well, the rich don't need the money. I mean, they're already rich. So if you encourage them via high tax rates uh, on their income um, not to deploy their capital to earn more income, well, then the poor won't have jobs and the, you know, the bottom 50% won't have economic opportunity because by definition, those economic opportunities come from the investment of capital from the rich. Um, if you transfer it to the government, if you take the richest money and give it to the government, well, first of all, you won't get as much because the rich will shelter some of their income. And that's really the book is about tax shelters. There's no, we are Bernie Sanders and stuff say, close the tax shelters. When has that ever happened in American history? It's 1913. There's only one way tax shelters have been closed. Lower the tax rate and diminish the value of the tax shelter. There is not one example of the value of the tax shelter going up through higher income tax rates that the tax shelters can actually be closed. They proliferate. So when you have tax shelters, you by definition are diminishing the opportunity for the bottom 
Um, so yeah, the transfer theorem is simply like if you, you you try to take from one group and give to the other, first of all, you're not going to be able to take from the one group. And when you give it to the other, um, they'll be in a worse state anyway because of the diminishment of opportunity. So how do we help the poor uh, and the lower socioeconomic rackets uh, understand this, that they should not be for uh, progressive taxation, high taxation on the wealthy and the job creators, uh, those that are running businesses and creating businesses? How do we help the poor to, I mean, we usually see this, the poor, the political left, particularly Democrats are saying, I'm for the poor, I'm on your side, we're gonna increase taxes on the rich. But yet this is actually hurting the poor in the long run. How do we how do we change that narrative? How do we help the poor understand that that's really hurting them in the long run? Yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not uh, convinced that the poor don't understand this perfectly. I I um, I think the you know, the the bottom 50 percent may well understand it very well. Um, I I. I might not even say that's a, that's an issue. I, I think it's sometimes the rich who kind of and the uh, credentialed and the established, the labor unions, uh, tax free zones, uh, and that includes the you know broad uh, kind of um, criminal areas of the country too, which effectively are tax free zones. You know, the drug drug trading and so forth. Um, you know, that's not reported. Uh, so no, I think it's the beneficiaries of of the tax system; those who uh, can take advantage of tax shelters and the uh, unenforcement of tax laws because tax rates are so high that are the constituency for the tax system, and those who benefit from lower taxes on the rich, including the bottom fifty percent. I, I think they understand these matters instinctually. So I I don't know that we have to convince them of anything, um, but I do think we have to um, make sure that the we have a kind of a virtue infusion on the part of those who are benefiting from high taxes. And those are people on the inside. Brian, the U S tax code is 70,000 pages long. Uh, that's a lot of tax code there. Much of it deals with exclusions and exemptions and write-offs for the top tax rates. If you could rewrite the tax code, what would that look like? Or maybe we, would you just get rid of this federal income tax altogether? <laughs> Yeah, I, w I certainly would uh, do, do that option. Um, well, first of all, in saying that the in, uh, revealing that the tax code is seventy thousand pages, we just identified more beneficiaries of the system. So, uh, you know, the tax bar, for example, did not exist uh, before nineteen thirteen, and now it's you know gigantic. So all those people uh, benefit or beneficiaries of a high tax system. Yeah, when, whenever uh, tax rates were were cut, um, and th they call it the uh, lawyers and accountants alarm bell, you know, <laughs> that's what they used to say. So, I mean, there are, there are specific beneficiaries. I personally have long felt my own view that the United States should not have any taxes at all. Um, if the United States uh, runs the international monetary system, if it can print money, uh, create money, U.S. dollars, and get anyone in the world to accept those dollars for their goods and services, there's absolutely no argument for the United States to have a tax system. So that's been the condition of the United States for at least 75 years. Um, so it's been a scandal. We've had a tax system ever, ever since the dollar has been the world's dominant currency. So let me press on that. So what you would suggest is that we could simply print money to pay our bills because the whole world economy is dependent on the U.S. dollar. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, I mean, that is that is the fact. It's been the fact since at least 1945. So uh, just through procurement, the United States could uh, fund itself. And just the, the, the United States is clearly the most pr efficient producer of money in the world. It's the greatest demanded currency. And the only thing people will give for it that the United States will accept are goods and services. They won't take your currency. So uh, because, by definition, because the United States is the most efficient currency, the most desired currency the world over, um, that we have had a tax system since 1945 is a scandal. There has been no reason whatsoever for the United States to have one iota of taxation since the dollar has been the world's dominant currency. Interesting, Brian. I've not heard that argument before. That's fascinating. Something to think about. However, uh, our national debt is at $32 trillion. Uh, we are slated to begin paying, I believe, a trillion dollars just to service that debt because of uh, increasing interest rates and just the sheer amount there. I think within a couple of years at the interest, the debt service payments are going to be a trillion. Look, we're, we're heading towards the fiscal cliff. Is there a way out of this? And here's where I'm going to connecting with the last point. If we continue this uh, debt spiral that we're in, 
uh, we're no longer going to be that reserve currency. Our currency will not be valued if we cannot pay on that debt. Correct? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, the debt is kind of ludicrous, and I, you know, I think that's just expression, an expression of the government's jealousy against the private economy. I mean, if if the government knows, I mean, look at the 1990s. If it starts running balanced budgets and surpluses, I mean, the government debt shrinks. <laughs> I mean. So non-existence. I mean, Alan Greenspan gave a famous speech in 2001, said, hey, look, we'll just run four straight years of surpluses. In no time flat, the Federal Reserve will not be able to conduct open market operations because there won't be a sufficient amount of government debt out there. Alan Greenspan gave that speech. It was totally accurate only 23 years ago in 2001. So the government has a vested interest in kind of breaking the economy with lots of debt. If it just started balancing the budget, running a modest surplus, just balance the budget. Uh, in no time flat, the debt problem would be eliminated. And that really shows that, you know, kind of the government's jealous of the private economy. It's just scared of the economy really growing like crazy and just being way bigger than the federal government. And that's where I get back to the virtue infusion. It's the founding fathers. You know, you got to have virtuous people in government. Your purpose in life, people in government, is to be small. So get small. So uh, where are we in, in relation to being uh, to, to heading over that fiscal cliff? I mean, is there a, are we at a point of no return? $32 trillion. I can't get my mind around that large of a number. Um, it doesn't seem like there's any way out of that. Uh, it, we do know that there is a breaking point for a government that gets itself head over heels into debt when it cannot pay the interest payments, when it cannot pay its bills that it owes to its creditors then the economy collapses, doesn't it? We, we've seen this throughout history. Are we heading to that place, Brian? I, I think it's very easy to solve. Um, I think if the budget were balanced and you know, if we had spending levels of 2019, you know, I mean, that's um, only yesterday, <laughs> uh, we balanced budget like that. And a balanced budget means you're always paying off your debt. I mean, most of the debt is you know, short-term debt. So your, your, your debt's going down immediately if you're balancing budget because you're paying it off. That's a budget item. So if you balance the budget for any time at all, the debt problem would evaporate um, as, as having any significance. I mean, the, the, the wealth in the United States, I think the Federal Reserve accounts for it now is about $125 trillion, $175 trillion, the private wealth of the United States. And what the total debt of the American government is $35 trillion, let's just say. Well, I mean, if you balance the budget, you would stop accumulating that debt. In fact, you start paying it down and you'd have this extreme explosion in the total net worth of the country. And that ratio would just gape. That's what happened in the 1990s. It's not like there's not any kind of model of how to deal with this. You know, everyone said, oh, Reagan's going to kill our grandchildren with his debt. We started running budget surpluses in the 1990s. The whole problem was gone in no time flat. So, I, you know, it's easily solvable. All you have to do is balance the budget. And Brian, a lot of people have uh, given up hope on the federal government. I haven't. But our focus at the Commonwealth Policy Center is on state government. We can have a greater impact here in the state of Kentucky. Now, the Commonwealth uh, is on track to phase out the state income tax. Just a couple of two, three years ago, it was at 6%. Right now, it's at 3.5%. And it's on track of being phased out within the next couple of years, so long as the state reaches certain benchmarks. How can we expect this to impact our state economy by phasing out that state income tax? Sure. Well, uh, you know, Richard, if Kentucky succeeds in that, it would be absolutely historic because no state has ever uh, eliminated its income tax outside of uh, trivial exceptions. Um, so I'm uh, pessimistic, if I may say so. Um, all sorts of states have pledged to do that. Ohio is pledging to do it right now. Uh, so is Iowa. Um, Arizona pledged to do it in the 1990s. No one has ever succeeded in doing that. Um, so if it does happen, that would be just kind of epic. I mean, I would expect a tremendous capital rush into Kentucky, but not until then, because uh, the investment community maintains a complete healthy skepticism about state level reform. As I mentioned, states accounted essentially for zero percent of GDP in revenue as of 1900, maybe you know less than one percent. And now they're nine percent of GDP. So state government shouldn't exist at all. Um, so to the extent it exists, which is, you know, pushing 10 percent of GDP, it's the states don't know what they're doing. You know, you, you kind of have to just completely get out of the business of government. So I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, you burst my bubble. I was optimistic that we were going to actually see this uh, state income tax phased out. Uh, however, they have made progress. They have uh, reduced it to separate occasions this year's biannual budget. They're set to reduce it again down to, I believe, 3%. So we are on track. We've made some headway. Look, I'd rather pay 3% than 6%. Uh, 
uh, state income tax. So we'll see, maybe Kentucky can be the first state to achieve this. And if that happens, we'll have you on to do another program and talk about it. <laughs> yeah, no, if it does have another tax cuts are great. That's great. It's gone from six to three. Uh, you know, that's a huge increase in the rate of return for the high end investor. Um, yeah, but what I'm saying is if, if it does happen in Kentucky, it would be a double, a double um, great thing in that, first of all, the income tax, you know, would be equalized with Tennessee zero and Kentucky would be the precedent center. So that would be a huge one. Brian, I want to talk about another aspect of tax policy. When people are allowed to keep more of their income that they earn, um, they're able to, of course, uh, invest, buy more, provide for their family, and also give. And this is what I want to talk about. When people have resources, they're able to not just use it for themselves and their families, but they're able to give. Uh, and in America, the United States is a very giving nation, isn't it? And this is possible because we have a robust economy and people have created wealth and uh, they've saved, but they also give. Can you can you speak to that, the importance of wealth creation in its relation to giving? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, with, with marginal income in particular, I mean, there's, there's, there's a particular propensity to give and to invest with the, the next dollar of income that you earn, especially, and that's what happens when you cut progressive tax rates. You keep what you've already been making, then you make, then what you, earn more, you keep more of. And that's exactly the dollar that goes to philanthropy, that goes to new investments and, and very little of it to kind of common consumption. So yeah, I mean, marginal tax rates have, cuts have everything to do with increased philanthropy. I mean, just what was the, <laughs> what was the country's philanthropic status quo as of 1912, the year before the income tax? I mean, indescribable philanthropy at that point in history. And again, that's why I assume one of the reasons, one of the ulterior motives of government to start an income tax is because, you know, government was jealous of private philanthropy and, you know, tries to set itself up. It's, it's this kind of do-gooder itself, this kind of conscience, the pseudo conscience of the of the nation. So, yeah, I mean, um, one of the reasons government has to cut marginal tax rates is because the proper philanthropists are the private sector. Along those lines, though, if government continues to perpetrate um, bad economic policy, high taxes, confiscatory taxes, if the federal government in particular continues to uh, accumulate this federal debt, um, it's in essence, it's working against itself. There is a breaking point, not just economically, but also with the voters. I think of a popular song that came out last year sometime, Richmond, North of Richmond. <laughs> it's a folk singer that uh, he was just performing to a small group and the song uh, got on Spotify and these other outlets and it went viral. It had like a hundred million listens in a very short period of time, but it spoke of people, the, the, really the political class in Washington, D.C., uh, that they're coming out ahead. They're doing very well financially, but the average guy, the blue collar guy working hard, um, man, they're struggling. Um, talks about the value of the dollar. Uh, it doesn't go as far as what it used to. I won't share the lyrics of it. Some of it's pretty crude, but it touched a nerve with the American people, Brian. Uh, there is, so my point is that it seems to me with the voters who see what's going on, they're working hard, they're playing by the rules, and yet they're not able to save, they're not able to provide for their families like they want to. Uh, it seems to me that there is, there are, will be consequences in an election. I don't know if it's this year or next year, but at some point there will be a consequence uh, as far as the kind of people that we send to Washington, D.C. to represent us. Yeah, I mean, Richard, I, I think uh, kind of the, the vast majority of kind of working people in the United States uh, understand these these uh, lessons intuitively. Um, I think our readership of taxes have consequences. Yeah, I, I know all this stuff. Oh, it's interesting, all these stories and these details and these proofs. But yeah, I mean, uh, I can understood this stuff anyway. So yeah, I, I, I think it, in a way, it's again, it's kind of not an intellectual challenge that we face. Uh, it's all kind of obvious. It's um, it's an ethical challenge. Uh, you know, I mean, what, you know, we're talking about it. This, you know, the American economy, this NVIDIA and all these companies going crazy, huge bursting production, lots of places in the United States, Nashville, Tennessee, you know, Texas, Florida. Uh, what do you mean the budget isn't balanced in Washington? We're running up a debt. That's absurd. I mean, we're just like a crazy productive economy. What do you have all these subsidies for? That's silly. 
So it's just these people, what do you need a brain transplant? What people in Washington, uh, it, it's a piece of cake to, to just have low taxes, low spending and have the debt go down and go. So if you're saying the problems are can't figure out how to solve it, well, then you're incompetent. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, yeah, Richmond, North of Richmond, put his finger on it. Yeah, very good. Brian, uh, your book, Taxes Have Consequences, uh, great historical information about the history of the income tax. It's a very readable book. Um, what else would you like to share? I know we, we uh, covered a bit. Uh, we're running out of time. But what else would you like to share with your book about your book, Taxes Have Consequences? We had some favorite tax cuts in history. Uh, one when maybe our favorite tax cut that we learned about in the book was that of 1948. Uh, that's when we got, uh, uh, that's when we had the married filing jointly uh, tax cut. Um, that's when we're states forced this on the federal government. The government didn't want to cut tax rates after World War II. They were 90%. And the states said that, well, we're going to switch to a community property regime where the wife can file a tax return with half the income and the husband can file after it cut the tax bill in half. <laughs> government wind, 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 wind. And all the states started shifting to community property and then the government just switched, cut tax rates. So when there's real pressure from the states, the government capitulates like that. And there's story after story like that in the book. And I hope we could capture that lightning again. Perhaps that's uh, something, uh, some advice to our state legislature here in Kentucky, where if we want to impact national tax policy, we can begin by taking action right here in the Commonwealth. Um, that's practical advice. I would say that that's what the founding fathers intended, though, that the, the state governments were supposed to be strong. The federal government was supposed to be weak and really serve it at the behest of the states and of the people. And that's uh, not the way it has been. Um, Brian, it's been a joy having you on the Commonwealth Matters. Uh, appreciate what you have done with your book, Taxes Have Consequences. Where can people find your book? Oh, it's kind of everywhere. It's on uh, yeah, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. They sell it all. Indie bookstores, you know, that's, uh, you, you can find it. Very good. And can people sign up to get your email updates? Do you have an email update? No, we don't. We have a periodic content on, uh, on the LafferCenter.org. Okay. Very good. Brian Dimitrovic, thank you so much for joining us on the Commonwealth Matters. God bless and keep up the great work. And if you're just tuning in again, you're listening to the Commonwealth Matters, please go to your favorite podcast platform and like us and then tell your friends about this program. That's a great way to help others to get to know who we are and what we're doing. Thanks again for tuning in and God bless you. <music>